Moses leads the Israelites to Mount Sinai, where God first spoke to him in the burning bush. gives laws to Moses, written in stone. The Ten Commandments.
Well, we're glad and we're happy that all could join us this evening for our special uh, meeting that we have planned uh, this evening. Brother Mosel Mack has uh, going to share with us the theme, Close the Gap. And so we're going to invite Brother Mack up now. Perhaps many in our audience have heard of a small device that's used to screw down in an internal combustion engine. It's called a spark plug. Now, the interesting thing about this particular device, this spark plug, it has these electrodes on it, and depending on the distance of the electrodes that's on the spark plug, that's uh, how it gets its spark, or the engine runs. Now, what's of great interest when it comes to spark plugs, note what uh, one mechanical magazine has to say about spark plugs. It says, as the plug, plugs erode, the electrodes that are on the spark plugs lose their nice sharp edges that are necessary to form a good hot spark. Now it also says that erosion widens the gap between the electrodes which increases the voltage needed to push the spark across the gap. Well, what we're explaining here is this little device that screws down in this internal combustion engine called the spark plug. These electrodes, the gap has to be just right in order for it to get its proper spark. Now, we didn't call you out here this evening to give you a lesson in auto mechanics. The point that we're simply making is that if the gap's too wide on this spark plug, the car won't run right. And if the gap is too narrow, the car still won't run right. Now note what the auto manufacturers said. They said, in order to create a reliable spark under all driving conditions, the plugs must be at the right distance. If they're not at the right distance, the plugs begin to misfire. Now that means that the engine becomes harder to start. It may run rough or cold. The car may hesitate when accelerating, or it just may not move at all under a heavy load. Most spark plugs come pre-gapped from the factory. But the gap may not be correct in every application. Well, again, our goal here this evening is not just to consider spark plugs or the engines of an automobile. But there is something we can learn from this little small device that goes in an internal combustion engine. What we learn is that if the gap is not at the right distance, the car won't run right. Well, really, we can compare our lives with this little spark plug. How, you might say? Well, we live at the end of a dying and a wicked system of things. And all of our lives are under heavy load. Our lives are under a lot of stress and a lot of strain. And really, there's a gap in our lives and there's a need for us to make sure the gap is at its proper distance. You see, being humans, there's a need for us to examine something. There's a need for us to examine how wide the gap is between what we know and what we do. Now here's why this is very important. You see, just like that spark plug has to be set according to the manufacturer's instructions, where we ourselves, there's a need for us to get the gap right between what we know and what we do. In fact, our lives have to be determined according to the manufacturer's instructions. Now, the great manufacturer is Jehovah God. We receive his instructions from his word, the Bible. Can we use God's word to examine our lives, the way we conduct ourselves, the things that we do, the things that we think about? Can we use God's word to determine just how wide the gap is between what we know and what we do? 
Now turn with me please in your Bibles. We like to turn to the book of Ephesians chapter 5. And here at Ephesians chapter 5, we want to draw your attention to verse, to verse 15. Now notice what the Bible tells us. The Bible says, so keep strict watch that how you walk is not as unwise, but as wise persons. Buying out the opportune time for yourselves because the days are wicked. Well, did you notice what the Bible is telling us? In verse 15, it uses this term, walk. It says, keep strict watch that how you walk. Well, usually in the Bible, when it uses this term, walk, it means your way of life. It means your set course. So the way we travel is not the speed of an automobile. It's not like an automobile, but really, the way we move is termed the way we walk. That's our lives. So now the Bible tells us to keep strict watch that how you walk is not as unwise but as wise persons. For what reason? Verse 16 tells us because the days, yes the days, are wicked. Well one way that we keep strict watch at how we walk is by making sure that we're tuned up as it were. Just like according to the manufacturer's instructions, they want that gap to be set just right. And from time to time, a car needs a tune-up. Now some of us may say, well, you know, brother, I'm walking pretty good. I've been walking for many, many years now. However, the verse goes on to tell all of us something. Notice what verse 16 tells us. It says, buying out the opportune time for yourselves because the days are wicked. Well, again, we live in the last days of a wicked and dying system. We refer to them as critical times hard to deal with. Really, they're exceptional times hard to reckon with. Reckon means to count. You ever wake up sometime and say, what day is it? The pressures and the trials and tribulations are so bad you forget what day it is sometimes. And the Bible tells us that we need to buy out the opportune time. Now stop and think about it. You know, time is moving so fast now, what little free time we have now, we may never have that much again. Remember years ago, it seems like you had a little bit more time than you have now. You see, time moves so fast, we have a tendency to measure time from event to event. Now I remember when I was a little boy, the only event we had in our life was Christmas. And it seemed like from Christmas to Christmas, it was 10,000 days long. But now look at our lives. There's no more Santa Claus and Christmas and things, but we have many events in our lives. You have to make a living. You have to go to school. You have to get ready for the circuit assembly, the district convention, the special assembly day, the talks that you have on the theocratic ministry school. From event to event, time moves so fast. Well, the Bible says, because the days are wicked, now's the time that we should make sure we're buying out time. That means to snap up time or intensify our efforts because, because the days are wicked. Now's the time to really keep strict watch. Now, note what else the Bible tells us in verse 17. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 17. The Apostle Paul says, on this account, cease becoming unreasonable, but go on perceiving what the will of Jehovah is. Now, do you notice Paul said on this account? Well, on what account? Well, the days are wicked. The days are wicked. Paul said, for that reason, now's the time to be reasonable. See what verse 17 tells us? Cease becoming unreasonable. Well, when Noah was on the earth and Jehovah gave him instructions on how he should survive, what was the only reasonable thing for Noah to do? What was the only way he was going to spare his life alive? The only reasonable thing for Noah to do was to build the ark, to follow Jehovah's instructions and build the ark. Why anything else Noah did with his life would have been senseless folly. Well, verse 17 tells us again, 
since the days are wicked, we should cease becoming unreasonable, but we should go on perceiving what the will of Jehovah is. You see, there's a need for us to make sure the gap is set right in our lives. We want to make sure the gap is just right, make sure that our lives are moving according to the manufacturer's instructions. We want to make sure that we're paying attention to how we ought to walk. Now, notice again what the Bible tells us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Because in a Bible discussion such as this, we certainly need to consider this particular portion of the Bible. And 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, now let's note carefully at what verse 1 and verse 2 tells us. The Apostle Paul again says, finally brothers, we request you and exhort you by the Lord Jesus. Just as you receive the instruction from us on how you ought to walk and please God, just as you are in fact walking, that you would keep on doing it more fully. Well again, Paul uses this term, walk. Paul's referring to our way of life. Did you notice that Paul said that the brothers had received certain instructions on how they ought to walk? Well, the faithful and discreet slave today, by virtue of the power that's been imparted to them, they give us all the instructions on what we ought to do. What the faithful slave says we ought to do. That's how we receive the manufacturer's instructions. That's how we can tell whether our lives are running well. Note again what Paul told the brothers there in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Verse 1, we request you and we exhort you by the Lord Jesus, just as you receive the instructions from us, yes, on how you ought to walk and please God, just as you are in fact walking, that you would keep on doing it more fully. Paul says, well, you may be running well, but he said there's a need to find to Maybe you are walking now in your life. Paul said there's a need to make sure you're doing it more fully. There's a need for all of us to make sure and check ourselves because, because the days are wicked. So now is the time to buy out the opportune time. Let's stop and think about it. You put forth great effort to come here this evening and that's good, you're to be commended. You don't normally have meetings on Saturday. And if we were to ask you a question, you could probably come up with a thousand and one things that you could do. Maybe some of the young ones in the audience right now are thinking about the game they could watch. Maybe some of the adults are saying, well, this is the only time I could relax, and you know I wanted to see that movie. Well, there's a host of other things you probably say, yes, I wanted to do. But you've bought out opportune time. Somehow you realize that the days are wicked. You cease becoming unreasonable right now at this time. You're trying to perceive what the will of Jehovah is. And that's good. But now, brothers and sisters, we need to examine whether we have the gap right. There's a need for us really to stop and look and see how wide the gap is between what we know and what we do. We're not here just for an intellectual exercise, nor are we here just to make a showing. But hopefully all of us have come here to examine our relationship with our Heavenly Father. We've come to see what we need to do to get the gap right and set our lives according to the manufacturer's instructions. Now turn with me please in your Bibles to the book of James chapter 1 because here we we begin to set the basis or the precedent for the rest of our discussion in the Bible in the book of James chapter 1 let's look at verse 21 James chapter 1 and verse 21 it tells us hence put away all filthiness and that superfluous thing badness and accept with mildness the implanting of the word which is able to save your souls. 
Well, the thing of optimum importance for us is to get our souls saved, to have our lives saved. But James said in verse 21, there's a need for us to put away all filthiness and that superfluous thing. Well, if something is superfluous, now according to the original Greek term, if something was superfluous, that meant it was, it was excess. It was surplus. It was excessive. It's something that we can do without. Well, James is telling us, now notice the inference in verse 21. He says we have to get rid of the superfluous thing and then we can accept with mildness the implanting of the word. Well, James is telling us that God's word cannot be implanted in us until we get rid of all the things in our lives that are excess. It's excess baggage. It's surplus. It's excessive. There are things in our lives in which we can do without. Well, the Bible tells us that we need to root out of our lives all of those things that cause lawlessness and stumbling. How many times have you heard a talk and you say, you know, that brother brought out a good point. I need to change that and we never change it. How many times have you been at a district convention or a circuit assembly and you say, boy, that was a good program and I'm going to do better. And somehow we just never seem to do better. Well, are there excess things in our lives? Are there things in our lives that we can do without? See, James says the word can't be implanted until you get rid of the excess baggage. So stop and think now, what is your life filled with? What are all the things that's taking up your time? What's keeping you from buying out the opportune time? Because remember, the days are wicked. So James says the first thing we must do is get rid of all of the excess. All of the things that complicate our lives. Be it recreation, entertainment, just our thought pattern, our dreams, our likes and our dislikes. James says, is it superfluous? You see, the word can't be implanted. It can't take root. Whenever you plant something, it has to be put in the soil. You have to move out all the rocks, anything else that's going to keep it from growing. That's all the excess. You move that out of the way, you want perfect soil, and then you plant the seed and you expect it to grow. James says that's the only way you're going to mature. That's the only way you grow. He says we have to get rid of that superfluous thing. Now, look what else the verse tells us here in James chapter 1. In James chapter 1, uh, this time, let's continue reading and we'll get a better understanding of what James is trying to tell us. In verse 22, this is the thrust of our discussion. However, become doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves with false reasoning. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, this one is like a man looking at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and off he goes and immediately forgets what sort of man he is. But he who peers into the perfect law that belongs to freedom and who persists in it, this man, because he has become not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, will be happy in his doing it. Well, what is the Bible writer telling us here? Did you notice what James said about a man that looks at himself in a mirror? How many of us dared to leave home this evening without looking in the mirror? We don't normally do that, do we? You know, now it's hard to sell a car unless it has a vanity mirror. That is a mirror on the passenger side. And we're not going to ask them to raise their hands, but I'm sure many of our sisters never leave home without their mirror. And most of us consult the trusty mirror in the bathrooms before we present ourselves even here in the kingdom hall. So we're familiar with the mirror then, aren't we? You understand what James is telling us? The mirror is really God's Word, the Bible. James says when you, when you read the Bible, well, you see yourself. James says when you come to the Kingdom Hall and listen to scriptural presentations, why well, you see yourself. When you attend the Christian meeting, James says you see yourself because the Bible shows, shows you exactly who you are. Now, how many of us would dare look at a mirror 
and you notice a little blemish or something on your face, it doesn't look good to you. How many of us look in the mirror, notice that blemish, and just off we go and we forget it was there? How many of us do that? No, we spend time to correct it, don't we? Well, James says, how many of us will read God's Word, the Bible, recognize what we need to do, what we need to adjust, and just off we go and forget what sort of man we are? That's not normal, is it? That doesn't normally happen. Now, James says that really, there's a need for us to be a doer of the word and not just a forgetful hearer. James says there's a need for us to close the gap between what we know and what we do. There's a need to get the gap right. There's a need again to make sure that our lives are running according to the manufacturer's instructions. So ask yourself, how wide is the gap between what you know and what you do? Is your life sputtering? Are you walking as though you're an engine that's missing? Remember that spark plug, unless the gap was right, it wouldn't, it wouldn't run under all conditions. Sometimes there's a heavy load to life. The spark plugs are not right, it, the car won't run. Sometimes due, uh, due to erosion, you know, all the trials and the tribulations that come on us in life. If the gap's not right, your life won't run well. Are you bordering on being disfellowshipped or reproved? Is your faith shaky as far as uh, God's grand blessing so near at hand? Do you really believe all of the promises that Jehovah God is giving us? Do you have courage among those in your neighborhood, those at school? Do your unbelieving relatives firmly know your stand? You see, there's a need to set the gap right. There's a need for us to exercise more fully now the difference between what we know and what we do. Now, what we'd like to do now is consider three specific areas. We've set the tone and we've discussed some generalities. And now, as Paul said, according to the instructions, we need to be specific. We're going to consider three areas in which all of us here this evening we can examine our lives. We can really see how wide the gap is between, well, on the one hand, what we know, and on the other hand, what we actually do. Let's look at these areas, and as we do, let's consider ourselves as individuals. We've already bought out the opportune time. Now's the time to cease being unreasonable. But let's perceive what the will of Jehovah is for each and every one of us. As individuals, yes, as families. First of all, let's look at our first area. Let's consider how wide the gap is between what you know and what you do in this first area. How are you doing in connection with Bible reading? How are you doing when it comes to reading your Bible? For the past five years now, the faithful and discreet slave has been keeping that before us. In fact, you have the privilege to live in the borough of Brooklyn, and right here in Brooklyn is the world headquarters of Jehovah's Witnesses. And on the side of one of the buildings on that world-famous uh, Brooklyn Bridge, before you mount the bridge, it says, Read God's Word, the Holy Bible, daily. You know, one night we had a talk at Bethel, and they were discussing how we as a Bethel family should read God's Word, the Bible. Why, when the brother addressed that subject, you could hear a pin drop, and we were sitting on carpet. The brother said, you wouldn't want to be hypocritical, would you, brothers? You wouldn't want that to be on the side of the buildings in which you work, and you don't read the Bible. Why, all of us had to examine ourselves. Well, for the past five years now, the slave has been telling us that all of us should make sure that we read God's Word, the Bible, daily. We know that. There should be no gap. But ask yourself, how wide is the gap between what you know and what you do? Do you read God's Word daily? Is it a regular part of your life? Remember, for Noah to do anything else would have been senseless folly. What did he need to do to spare his life alive? 
He needed to build that ark. Those were the instructions from the manufacturer. Well, what instructions are we receiving today? First and foremost is to read God's Word, the Bible, daily. Notice what the Bible tells us in the book of Exodus chapter 24. Now, here in Exodus chapter 24, more was involved in just reading God's Word, the Bible. Did you know that there was a response that was required? Just simply reading God's Word was not enough. But Jehovah expected a response. In Exodus chapter 24, let's look together at verse 7. Finally, he took the book of the covenant and read it in the ears of the people. Then they said, all that Jehovah has spoken, we are willing to do and be obedient. You notice there was a response. When he read the Bible to them, Jehovah expected a response. Now, notice what else the Bible tells us in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 27. Let's turn there together, please. Here in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 27, and this time we want to look at verse 26. Because more than just reading God's word was required. Now, Deuteronomy 27, 26, it says, Cursed is the one who will not put the words of this law in force by doing them. And all the people must say, Amen. So there was a difference in just hearing the word. There was a need to do it. In fact, at that time, the Bible says you would be cursed if you didn't do it. So there's a difference between knowing and doing. But Jehovah God, he required a response. Well, on our part today, it's obvious that Bible reading is very important. That's why the faith and discreet slave has kept that before us. They've encouraged us to read God's word daily. Not just to read it, but a response should come from us. We should feel as though we're cursed if we read God's word and we don't respond to what's there on that printed page. That's why the king of the nation of Israel was told to make a copy of it. He was told to read it and to copy it, to become very familiar with it. Now eventually the nation stopped reading God's word. It had become a relic to them. When they finally found it, they hardly knew what it was. It was almost like a souvenir that was somewhere in the temple. Well, as Jehovah's people today, is the Bible like a relic to you and perhaps your family? You see, it would be a mistake to read Bible-based publications and not read the Bible. It would be a mistake for us to read The Watchtower and the Awake and other publications and not read God's Word. That's like conducting a Bible study and you tell the person you study with, you don't have to read the Bible, just read the paragraphs. Wouldn't that be a mistake? Well, that's the same mistake we can make in our lives if we're not constantly making sure that we read God's Word. You see, each scripture is like a diamond. A diamond is a prism. You know what a prism is? That's a little device that if you hold it up under light and as you turn the prism, all of its different phases and facets will start to glitter and glisten under that light. You see all the different shades and meaning of that prism. Well, each scripture is just like that. And as you read the Bible over and over again, you begin to see the different phases and facets of a particular scripture. Also, Jehovah's trying to tell us something. I'd like to ask you a question just as an audience here. Uh, what's your favorite meal? Let's just think of a favorite meal. Anyone like to mention that? What's your favorite meal? Anybody have a favorite meal? Oh, you don't eat here in Brooklyn, huh? Is that what it is? I know you're a little shy, you might be a little sleepy, but let's wake up just a little bit here. What's your favorite meal, my brother? Go right ahead. Steak. Oh, that's a safe one, isn't it? Steak. Can you eat steak every day? Uh, how often can you eat steak? How many days straight? Two days straight. Anyone else have a favorite meal? One that you just love. Go ahead, my brother, right there. Yes. Curry. All right, that's a good one, especially in these parts. Can you eat curry every day? For how many days straight would you like to eat curry? Five days straight. One time I gave this talk and I asked a young brother his favorite meal. He said, pancakes. 
I said, how often could you eat pancakes? He said, I could eat them all year. He almost messed up my talk. But stop and think about it. Think about your favorite meal. Would it be loving for someone to expect you to eat your favorite meal every day? Would that be loving? Now, some wives, they know their husband's favorite meal. Would you expect it to be loving of that wife if she made him that same meal every day for 30 days? Would that be loving? You wouldn't think so, would you? Would it be loving if you expected someone to eat the same meal every day for 365 days? Would that be loving? No. How about for five years? Maybe 10 years? It would certainly no longer be your favorite meal, would it? You'd you, you, you learn to dread it. But do you know something, brothers and sisters? Stop and think about it. Jehovah God is the most loving personage in all the universe. Isn't that true? You know Jehovah had the nation of Israel eat manna for 40 years? Was that loving? Has Jehovah ever did anything that was not loving? He had the nation of Israel eat manna for 40 years. Why? What was he trying to tell them? What was Jehovah explaining to them? Better yet, what does that have to do with us reading God's word, the Bible, every day? Well, let's turn to Deuteronomy. Let's look at it. Get in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 8. Let's learn a lesson that our Heavenly Father, Jehovah, was trying to give to the nation of Israel. In Deuteronomy, chapter 8, let's notice verse 3. The Bible says, so he humbled you and let you go hungry and fed you with the man which neither you had known nor your fathers had known now here's the reason why in order to make you know that not by bread alone does man live but by every expression of Jehovah's mouth does man live Jehovah was trying to tell them something Jehovah was teaching them something you know Jehovah's telling us the same thing today you notice that in this time period in which we live, with the problems and the trials that we have, life gets so terrible, sometimes we just feel like we want to go out and do something reckless, don't we? We just say, well, I want to go out and watch a movie. I don't care what it's rated, I just want to go see the movie. Or we say, well, you know, I want to go and buy a dress. I know I can't afford it, I don't care how much it costs, I'm going shopping. That's why the malls are always full and it's supposed to be in the depression. And sometimes we just want to go on a vacation. We want to do something different. Well, Jehovah's saying now, your life is not based on you going to the movie. Your life is not based on you buying clothes. Your life is not based on you getting any other form of enjoyment. Your life is based on you knowing my word. That's the most important thing in your life. Jehovah had to humble the nation of Israel. He wanted them to understand that. Now today, Jehovah lovingly allows us to humble ourselves. The Bible says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Jehovah says, you don't want me to humble you. If I have to humble you, there won't be anything left. Jehovah says, humble yourself. Just read my word every day. Learn from me. Learn what I want you to learn. Jehovah says, just read the Bible. That's where you're going to find out the real enjoyment of life. That's where you're going to learn what life is really all about. Jehovah says, you don't live by bread alone. No, that's not it. But you live from every expression coming from my mouth. It was really loving when Jehovah had them eat the manna. He was preparing them as a nation. He wanted them to understand all that they needed to know in order to go into promised land. It was loving. And Jehovah expects us to feed on his word, the Bible, every day, just like that. Thankfully, he wants us to humble ourselves. Can you be humble enough just to consult God's word every day? Can you humble yourself enough just to consider what Jehovah wants you to consider daily? Or maybe we're just a little too prideful. 
Maybe we feel that we know it all. Perhaps the only thing that's keeping us from reading God's Word daily is just arranging our schedule as proud as we are. As proud and as busy as we may feel we are. You know, it's interesting how some people can arrange their schedule. They make it to work every day. You ever notice that? Some can arrange their schedule to watch a television show every day. Or at least weekly. Their schedule is set. Some arrange their schedule for entertainment, recreation. They don't miss. Jehovah says, humble yourself. Read my word. You see, there's a need to set the gap right. There's a need for us to examine how wide the gap is between what we know, yes, and what we knew. We know we should read God's word. Now here lately, the faithful slave has told us that just 10 to 15 minutes a day is all that's needed. Just 10 to 15 minutes a day. Now more recently in our service meeting, they said, well, just, well, just 10 minutes a day. Can you read God's word for just 10 minutes? How many of us had made sure that we've read God's word every day? Just 10 minutes. Note what some suggestions were given. Reading the Bible is very different from reading a book of fiction. Most popular fiction is designed for a single reading. Once a person knows the story and how it ends, that's all there is to it. To a discerning person, the scriptures constantly take on fresh meaning. As a person broadens his experience in life and copes with life's problems, the discerning Bible reader appreciates more fully the counsel he may formerly have read only casually. Have circumstances changed in your life? There are some gems in the Bible that you probably appreciate. Another suggestion that society gives us. They say you personally may have read the Bible and applied its counsel over a period of years. But perhaps you are now taking on new responsibilities in life. Are you planning to get married? Shame on a person planning to get married and not reading God's word every day. Shame on a person who plans to get married and not reading God's word every day. It could end in disaster. Are you going to be a parent? We dread anyone that's going to have children in this system and is not reading God's word of the Bible. Are your children having problems? Are you having problems rearing your children? Perhaps you're not reading God's word. Maybe the word's not being implanted. Are there some superfluous things, some things that are excess that you can do without, that you can root out of your lives so that you can take the time to read God's word? Note what the suggestions go on to say and ask us. Have you been entrusted with responsibility in the congregation as an elder or a ministerial servant? Have you become a full-time evangelizer with added opportunities for preaching and teaching? How beneficial it would be to read the Bible over again with these new responsibilities in mind. Another suggestion the society gave us. In the May 1st, 1995 Watchtower, for those that are running notes, they gave us some, some suggestions to enhance our Bible reading. They gave us 12 suggestions that we could consider that would make the Bible come alive. You know, many of the young men here can handle a, a football, basketball, or a soccer ball very well. But can they handle the Bible as well as they can handle the ball? Do they read God's Word enough? Are they that familiar with it? Jehovah's telling us, humble yourself. Cease becoming unreasonable. Because the days are wicked. Another loving suggestion. Notice uh, some suggestions that were given by the faithful and discreet slave. Many who succeed with a program of personal Bible reading do their reading early in the morning before they get started with the day's activities. Others find that they are better able to do it consistently at another time. Some have taken advantage of audio cassettes. Have you noticed all of the trouble that the society is going through now for us to pay attention to God's word? We have it on cassette. 
Have you ever played a cassette of God's Word in your home? You know, an interesting thing about cassettes, if you just cut it on, if you were to play the same cassette every day for 30 days, you'd be surprised how much you learn about God's Word. Just cut it on. You can go ahead and brush your teeth. Go ahead and comb your hair. You can go ahead and clean up. Just let the cassette play. Let God's Word fill your mind. Before you know it, you'll start quoting things that's in God's Word, the Bible. You heard it on a cassette. You'll read the scriptures better. Haven't you noticed that there's a scene in a movie you'd love to forget, but you just can't forget it? Have you ever noticed that? There's a lyrics to a song. You don't even want to sing it, but sometimes you sing it. You ever gone shopping in Christmas? You're not careful. You'll come out of there singing jingle bells, won't you? You heard it. It was implanted on your brain. Can you do the same thing with God's word? Now, some have a nice CD collection, we're sure. Some do not have one book of the Bible in their home on cassette. Not one. At least get Genesis. Everyone starts with Genesis. Some do not have one Bible book on cassette. Well, if you're not reading God's Word, can you listen to it on cassette? Can you listen to God's Word play? Yes, for years now, the society has been telling us to read God's Word, the Bible. We know that. There should be no gap. But how wide is the gap between what you know and what you do? You see, there's a need to set the gap right so that we can walk more fully in our lives. Let's consider our second area. We said we had three areas. Let's consider area number two, family study. How are you doing when it comes to study with your family? For decades, the slave has told us that we should study with our families. For decades, the cry has gone forth that every individual should have a regular family study. Yes, again, we'd say there should be no gap. But how wide is the gap between what you know and what you do when it comes to your family. Now, we're not going to ask you to hurt yourself and raise your hand, but are you studying with your family? Jehovah wants us to go through the tribulation organized. He organized the nation of Israel, and they received the promised land based on families. Remember the promised land? It was divided based on families. The book study groups are usually divided based on families. No wonder the slave has been telling us to have a regular study with our family. Whether you have children or not, are you studying with your wife? Because that's your family. Whether the head of the house is a believer or not, the spiritual head in the family. Are you making sure that the family is regularly considering God's word? What's keeping you from having a regular family study? Is it something that's superfluous? Something that's in your life that's excess, that you can do without? Is there something that's excessive, that's filling all of your time? Is it movies or recreation? Have you seen Star Wars lately? How many of us have seen all, all of the uh, society's tapes on the series on the Bible? Have we seen that series? Some have stood in line for hours to see Star Wars. You've got blobs taking over the earth, and Jehovah's trying to tell us about a kingdom. For decades now, Jehovah's told us to study with our family. Where is your family in your life? Do you put your family first? Notice what Jehovah told us in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6. We all need to turn back there together. In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6, look on the road, whatever you're doing, you should regularly make sure that you study with your family. You should feed your family spiritually. For those that are the heads of the household, how wide is the gap between what you know and what you do? Is there a regular feeding program with your family? You know, it's interesting that many can use the Bible pretty good out in field service. Why some come to the Kingdom Hall and they can give a good talk. And they can use the Bible pretty good here in the Kingdom Hall. Do you ever use the Bible at home? 
Do you ever have Bible-based discussions at home? That's a question that could come up. How about your wife or your children? Are they familiar with the meat of God's Word? Do they know the deeper things of God? Have you been feeding their hearts and their minds so they can understand the grand blessings from God so near at hand? For those parents in the audience, let's turn to Hebrews chapter 5 and then by extension all of us who are interested in this and assisting those that are parents and the children, why we want to certainly turn there too. In the book of Hebrews chapter 5, this is one advantage of having a regular study with your family. Now Jehovah God is certainly the most loving father there ever was. And it's by means of his example that Jesus Christ can be the head of the congregation. And certainly by following the example of both of them, any family head can take the proper lead with their family. But in Hebrews chapter 5, we learn something here. Let's turn together in verse 7. We learn something about Jehovah. In Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 7, it says, In the days of his flesh, Christ offered up supplication and petition to the one who was able to save him out of death with strong outcries and tears, and he was favorably heard for his godly fear. Now the Bible tells us that Jesus, as perfect as he was, Jesus served Jehovah with tears, with strong outcries. It was a struggle for Jesus to remain faithful. But the Bible tells us that Jehovah his father you see what verse 7 tells us at the end? It says, and Jesus was favorably heard for his godly fear. How many parents are hearing their children? Are you hearing your children out? Are your children favorably heard by you? You know, the reports say now that more than ever before, young ones are committing suicide. Young ones are killing themselves more than ever before. On an unprecedented scale, young ones are killing themselves. And the vast majority of them always leave a note before they kill themselves. They're crying out for help. They wanted to talk to someone. Certainly in the truth, are your children favorably heard by you? Or do you say, boy, I don't want to hear it. Girl, get somewhere and sit down. Well, the family study is a wonderful time for your children to be favorably heard by you. You see, Jehovah, lovingly Father, he favorably heard his son. Jesus was under trial and tribulation. Have you stopped to think about the trials that your children are undergoing? Really, as a family, do you really work together as we live in these days that are wicked? Have you ever stopped to think that sometimes those in your family feel that no one understands them? Husbands, again, you don't have to admit it right now, but you ever had that feeling that your wife just doesn't understand you? You ever thought that way? She doesn't really understand. Wives, have you ever felt that way? You ever felt that your husband just doesn't understand you? You say, well, he's trying. I know he's trying hard. I'm going to work with him, but he doesn't understand. He really doesn't understand. And certainly we know the children feel that their parents don't understand. And you know, the fact of the matter is you're probably right. Parents, it's hard for us to imagine everything that the children go through. You know, some parents don't even know what Freshman Tuesday is. They never heard of Freshman Tuesday or Sophomore Friday. They don't know anything about that. And if they have heard about it, they probably thought it was a basketball game they said that you couldn't go to. They don't really understand why some of the parents have no idea what the young ones have to deal with in school. Why, young brother told me, we, me and another brother were over there trying to make a shepherding call on him. And we call ourselves, you know, we're brother elder now. We're over there trying to talk to him about the scriptures. The young brother said, Brother Mac, just the way the girls come to school is sexual harassment. They don't have to say anything. It's just the way they show up at school. I feel harassed sexually. You know, some parents don't understand that. The brother looked at me in the eye and said, Brother Mac, you're trying to tell me to keep my eye on the prize. You're trying to tell me to keep my eye on the prize and the way they come to school. Later on, he said, Brother Mac, I've been looking at the thighs and not the prize. 
But you know, let's face it, parents, sometimes we just don't understand what they're going through. It's a struggle. They're trying to serve God with strong outcries and tears, and some of the children are not favorably heard. Do you care enough about them to study with your family? Anything else is senseless folly. What will you do to spare their lives alive? For decades, the slave has said, study with your family. They're faithful to their job. The slave is not only faithful, but they're also discreet. And they do everything they're supposed to do to help us with our families. They provide books, publications, magazines, special articles for all in the family. And some of us never take the time to study them. You see, there's a need to set the gap right. We need to have the gap set according to the manufacturer's instructions. There's a need for us to fine tune and to show all of the concern that we really have for our family. Because the days are wicked, remember. There's a need to buy out the opportune time. Everyone in your family should be clued in with Jehovah and know exactly what he's doing today. Let's turn in our Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 6. Now this is an interesting Bible account, but we learned something here. In 2 Kings chapter 6, yes, for all of us, and admittedly so, all of us are imperfect. We're lowly humans. And one day we're up and the next day we're down. It's called manic depression. One day we can conquer the world and the next day we, we barely know our name. Why we're trying to remain faithful in this system. In fact, the society says just trying to remain faithful sometimes is enough to make you think you're mentally disturbed sometimes. Just trying to remain faithful. The slave has said it in the watchtower. Some of us feel we're mentally disturbed because the days are wicked. And certainly, some of us feel that we're all by ourselves. We think we're alone. But do you and your family work together as a team? Does everyone recognize that we're not alone? We need to go back to the life of a man named Elisha. He was a faithful servant of God in 2 Kings chapter 6. Now, what's so interesting about this particular Bible account? Elisha would find out everything that the enemy wanted to do, and he would tell the king of Israel. The king of Israel would act on it, and Israel would come off victorious. They would win the battle. Now, the enemy was very upset. Let's look at 2 Kings chapter 6. Let's look at verse 11 together. Consequently, the heart of the king of Syria became enraged over this matter, so that he called his servants and said to them, Will you not tell me who from those who belong to us is for the king of Israel? You see, he wants to know who's the spy in our midst. We don't have TVs and television and uh, video cameras. How do they find out everything I say? Notice what his servant said. Then one of his servants said, None, my lord the king, but it is Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, that tells the king of Israel the things that you speak in your inner bedroom. So he said, You men go and see where he is, that I may send and take him. Later, the report was made to him, saying, There he is in Dothan. Immediately, he sent horses and war chariots and a heavy military force there. And they proceeded to come by night and close in upon the city. When the minister of the man of the true God rose early to get up and went out, why? There a military force was surrounding the city with horses and war chariots. At once the attendant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? Well, this attendant was Elisha's servant. He served with Elisha. At that time, he was really part of Elisha's family. They worked hand in hand together. And him and Elisha, they had laid down to go to sleep. When the attendant woke up, he said that they were surrounded. He noticed that they were surrounded all around. He said, Master, what shall we do? We are in trouble. Notice the response. Verse 16. But he said, Do not be afraid, for there are more who are with us than those who are with them. Now right now, the attendant is saying, Where are they? Because I sure don't see them. We are surrounded and we're in trouble. But note what Elisha tells him. 
and verse 17. And Elisha began to pray and say, O oh, Jehovah, open his eyes, please, that he may see. Immediately, Jehovah opened the attendant's eyes so that he saw and look. The mountainous region was full of horses and war chariots of fire all around Elisha. So they weren't alone, were they? The enemy brought war chariots, and now Jehovah had war chariots of fire all around them. They weren't alone, were they? You know, brothers and sisters, we're never alone. We're backed up by angels. We're dealing with God. And if we knew how close Jehovah was to us, we'd walk like giants. But humbly so. But we'd walk like giants. Does your family see that? You expect your children to be faithful to Jehovah, but if you don't study with them, how will they be reminded that they're not alone? How can they walk like giants in this world? Because the days are wicked. The schools are almost wicked. They're wicked at work, you say, sometime when you come home. How can your family survive unless you study with them? Many times you have to pray Jehovah open up their eyes so that they can see. Help them to see that we're not alone. Regardless of what you go through, regardless of who understands you, you're not alone. And a family study keeps this before your family. It's just a beautiful thing to hear the expressions of your family, the expressions of your children, of your husband and your wife, your son and your daughter. That's a beautiful thing. It strengthens your faith. But do you take the time to study with your family? There should be no gap. We know that. But really, brothers and sisters, how wide is the gap between what we know, yes, and, and what we do? How wide is the gap? Yes, there's a need to set the gap right. There's a need for us to do like the electrodes on the spark plug. We want to make sure they're set according to the manufacturer's instructions. The instructions we get from the faithful and discreet slave. The reminders that we receive from God's organization. And really, every member of your family should be interested in saving the lives of everyone else. It shouldn't be such a chore to gather everybody together for the study. It shouldn't be such a chore or a bore to learn about God. Remember, Jehovah said, humble yourself. Maybe you don't want to study with the family because you're not humble. Maybe you don't want to sit in with the family because you're not humble. Jehovah says, humble yourself under my mighty hand so that I can exalt you in due time. Jehovah says, if I have to humble you, there won't be anything left. They'll hear about you. That's about all. There won't be anything left. Can we show the love and concern for our family and make sure that we do all we can to study with them? You remember the woman Rahab? You recall the outstanding thing about her? Remember her main concern was not just for herself? Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Joshua, chapter 2. There's a need to go back and consider that account. As we learn about Rahab, we, we learn something there about her. In the book of Joshua, chapter 2. Now we pick up this account. When the Israelites, yes, they sent spies into the land. But in Joshua chapter 2, the two spies, somehow they were found out, and now they need to be concealed in Jericho. In Joshua chapter 2, let's look together at verse 8. Now the Bible tells us, As for these, before they could lie down, she herself came up to the roof, that is Rahab, and she went on to say to the men, now notice this, brothers and sisters. I do know that Jehovah will certainly give you the land, and that the fright of you has fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land have become disheartened because of you. For we have heard of how Jehovah dried up the waters of the Red Sea from before you, when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were on the other side of the Jordan, namely Sihon and Og whom you devoted to destruction. Now Rahab, she had some details, didn't she? 
It was like she had a Bible study, but she had some details. She mentioned the two men by name, the Dukes of Sihon and Og. She mentioned them. Verse 11, she said, when we got to hear it, then our hearts began to melt. And no spirit has arisen yet in anybody because of you. For Jehovah your God is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. And now please, swear to me by Jehovah that because I have exercised loving kindness toward you, you also will certainly exercise loving kindness toward the household of my father. And you must give me a trustworthy sign. And you must preserve alive my father and my mother and my brothers and my sisters and all who belong to them. And you must deliver our souls from death. Do you see Rahab's concern? Not just with her own flesh. Why, if you're a teenager in a household, do you show the same concern for all of those in your family? Do you want to make sure that not just your mother, your father, but your brothers and your sisters, your cousins, your aunts, your uncles, all those in the house have an opportunity to learn about God? Or are you just selfishly thinking about yourself? There's a need to get the gap right. You see, Rahab said, give me a trustworthy sign and you're going to save everybody or else there's no deal. I'm going to tell on you. She said, you must give me a trustworthy sign that all will be saved or else there's no deal. Is that your concern with your family? Yes, again we ask, how wide is the gap between what we know and what we do when it comes to studying with our family? Do we have a regular study with our family? Do we make sure that our family feeds on God's Word, the Holy Bible, daily, or at least weekly? Are we regular in a study? Well, let's consider our third point. There's a need for us to examine point number three, meeting attendance. How are you doing when it comes to attending the meetings? You know, in the United States, meeting attendance at midweek meetings are less than 80%. That means if you have 100 publishers, not quite 80 are regular at meeting attendance during the week. For decades now, the slave has been telling us that we should attend our meetings. It's where we come and learn about God. You know, a meeting miss is a blessing miss. Really, every time you miss a meeting, you're missing a blessing. There are things that are said here in this kingdom hall, right here on this platform, that will never be repeated again. When you miss the meeting, you miss that. Jehovah's Holy Spirit was bringing out expressions out of a particular brother and sister's heart. That might be the only time it's said that way. Jehovah had it there for the household. You know, a meeting miss is a blessing miss. And you know, the slave is a little alarmed about it. They mention it to the traveling brothers, the district's overseers, the circuit overseers. They mention it quite often to us there at Bethel, the members of the governing body. They're praying long and they're praying hard about your friends. If you could hear some of those brothers' prayers, they'd scare you to death. They're doing all they can to prepare the meetings for us. Did you know a meeting miss is a blessing miss? Now when Jesus talked to his followers there in Matthew chapter 10, it was like a service meeting. He were giving them service direction on how they would go out and preach and teach. And you'd probably say, well, now, if I could have been at that meeting, I would be a preacher. You know, Jesus is still with us at every meeting. And you're not making all of them. Midweek meeting attendance is less than 80%. Can you believe that? In the more affluent countries like the United States. Why? Are there some superfluous things that are keeping us from attending the meetings? Is there something in excess? Is there something that we can do without? Now note what some have said has caused them to miss the meetings. These are just some of the reports that were from our service department. Notice what some have said. Maybe you've heard some of these. Some have said, you know, I was tired. You ever heard that before? I was tired. Others, sleepy, not feeling well. Some say I had to cook. Some just simply say, the kids. Circle over here say, many just say, the kids. And some go ahead and fess up, you know what they say? I just couldn't make it. I just couldn't make it. But yet a meeting that is missed, we're really missing a blessing from Jehovah. There's a need for us to stay with the group. Jehovah has given us some divine instructions. Hebrews, yes, chapter 10 there, talks about not forsaking the gathering of ourselves together. Well, I remember two years ago, the society gave us a fine point on that. 
The society told us that it's a divinely inspired standard for all Christian meetings. That is, all Christian meetings should set a certain standard in which that everyone who attends should be incited to love and fine works. That means all of us as individuals should do our part to make sure that someone at the meeting that night was incited. Now, in order to do that, we need to participate, right? Well, you know why some don't enjoy the meetings? They don't have much to say. They don't participate. They feel the meeting was dead, it wasn't lively. Well, why didn't you comment? At least your comment would have livened things up. You could have said, well, did you hear my comment? I kind of livened things up a little bit there. What a grand privilege we have to participate with Jehovah in this educational work. And the privilege that we have to take part in the meetings. Never underestimate that. Never lack the appreciation that Almighty God Jehovah gives us to take part in upbuilding and inciting our brothers and sisters. You know, we usually enjoy a meeting more when we have a part in it. Whenever we have something to say. Tomorrow at the Watchtower study, make sure that Holy Spirit is really working with you. You see, the brother that conducts the Watchtower, he's really just that. He's just a conductor. And if you look at any orchestra where you have the professionals, the conductor, he just is a conductor. But the music is really being played by the orchestra. And a society tells Watchtower study conductors that that's the way the meeting should be. Why, if everyone is prepared and they're ready to comment, you'll have Holy Spirit bouncing off the audience all over the place. And all the conductor has to do is conduct. But you're trying to do your part to make sure that anyone who comes, they're upbuilt. They're incited to love and find works. So prepare for your meetings. Make sure you attend them. Make sure you're always on hand. If you don't have anything to say, just raise your hand and say, Brother, we're on paragraph 12. Just raise your hand and say, Brother, we're on paragraph 12 because it's a grand privilege to be able to take part in the meeting. Now, in countries where the work is under ban, meeting attendance is not down 80%. In countries where individuals have to fend for their life just to make it to a meeting, the meetings are well over 95 to 100%. And that 5% are not there, we know why they couldn't meet. But that's not the case here in the United States and other more affluent countries. How wide is the gap between what we know and what we do when it comes to our meetings? Do we really attend our meetings regularly? Notice this scripture here. It's quite interesting. The society has had many comments on it over the years. But let's look at it again and we want to examine it under this light, our meeting attendance. Let's turn to the book of Zephaniah, chapter 2. Here in the Bible, in the book of Zephaniah, chapter 2, there's an interesting point that we want to consider together. In the second chapter of Zephaniah, New World Translation, that's 1194, Chapter 2 starts. Here the Bible writer explains something to us. Zephaniah chapter 2, we want to look at verse 3 together. He says, Seek Jehovah, all you meek ones of the earth, who have practiced his own judicial decision. Seek righteousness. Seek meekness. Probably you may be concealed in the day of Jehovah's anger. Yes, the Bible tells us to seek meekness. To seek Jehovah's righteousness. The Bible says, now probably if you do that, you may be concealed in the day of Jehovah's anger. Now the question is, how is Jehovah going to conceal us? Those that are faithful, that are seeking meekness and righteousness, they have to be concealed. But the question is, how is Jehovah going to do that? That's what Zephaniah's name means. It means to be concealed by God. So how would you say that Jehovah is really going to conceal us in the day of his burning anger? Now, you know, years ago, talking to one older brother there at Bethel, he said years ago, they felt that Jehovah was going to conceal them at, at Yankee Stadium in the polo grounds. You know, that's when they used to have all the district conventions there. And uh, they would meet together at Yankee Stadium in the polo grounds. So the brothers felt that eventually, they were all going to be there at Yankee Stadium in the polo grounds, and that's how Jehovah was going to conceal them. But then the brother said, you know, it, it wasn't too long before the organization got too big for Yankee Stadium. He said it wasn't long after that that they tore down the polo grounds. He said, so now here we were trying to wonder, how was Jehovah going to conceal us? Have you ever considered that? How was Jehovah going to conceal you? Well, let's, let's turn to Genesis chapter 7. This helps us to appreciate this. In Genesis chapter 7, Jehovah gave us a sterling parallel. 
it helps us to stop and think about what the society has been telling us over the last few years. In Genesis chapter 7 and verse 16, now we're going to go back to the life of Noah, but it's something interesting mentioned here in verse 16. Genesis chapter 7 and verse 16, it says, And all those going in, male and female of every sort of flesh, went in, just as God had commanded him. After that, Jehovah shut the door behind him. You notice that? Now once Noah went into the ark, Jehovah shut the door behind him. He couldn't open up the door even if he wanted to. He couldn't go back on his word. Noah was concealed in the ark. And Jehovah shut the door behind him. That's how Noah was concealed. Jehovah shut that door and he says, Noah, you're safe. You went in, I'm closing the door behind you, now you're concealed. Now the thing about it, Jehovah's not going to shut any doors for us today. So how are you going to be concealed? Jehovah's not going to shut any doors for us today. That's why we have to cease becoming unreasonable. Because the days are wicked. It's up to us to buy out the opportune times. We have to humble ourselves. Jehovah's not going to shut any doors for us today. So the question comes up, how are you going to be concealed? What do you have to do to spare your life alive? Well, another verse helps us to appreciate this. Let's turn to Isaiah chapter 26. And here we, we put all of our verses together and we understand what Almighty God is telling us. Here in the book of Isaiah chapter 26, Jehovah makes a sterling cry for all of us. He gives us instruction in Isaiah chapter 26. Notice very carefully verse 20. Jehovah says, go my people, Enter into your interior rooms and shut your doors behind you. Hide yourself for but a moment until the denunciation passes over. You see, Jehovah's not going to shut any doors. You have to shut your own door. Now, Jehovah says you can be concealed, you can hide if you go into your interior rooms. What are the interior rooms today? It's the well over 80,000 Christian congregations. You have to be a viable part of the Christian congregation. That's the only way you're going to be concealed. If you're not a working part of the Christian congregation, if you just show up at the meetings, maybe at Clarkson and Bergen, but you're not really a part of the congregation, you haven't shut the door. And Jehovah's not going to shut any doors. The only way that you survive is by attending your Christian meetings, being a part of it. Not just being around the congregation, not just hearing of the congregation, but you have to be a working part. Oprah Winfrey is not going to tell you that. Michael George is not going to tell you that either. And many, many others. Only the faithful and discreet slave is going to tell you that. That's how you close the gap. We must attend our meetings. The society told us that anyone who deliberately stays away from the meetings, they've disfellowshipped themselves from the Christian congregation. You've disfellowshipped yourself from the Christian congregation if you purposely stay away from the meetings. And when Jehovah's denunciation comes, shame on you. Jehovah's not going to shut any doors. So how do you do when it comes to attending your meetings? Do you make sure that you make it at every meeting? Do you participate? If the denunciation comes, can Jehovah see that you're a working part of that Christian congregation? Yes, how wide is the gap between what we know and what do we do? We do live at the end of a wicked and dying system. Very soon now, Jehovah's going to give a signal to his commander, and there's going to be a slaughter unprecedented. The angels are going to wreak havoc on this earth. And you and I, we cannot even imagine what it's going to take for us to survive. We're going to see destruction all around. We're getting ready to face the attack of Gog of Magog. That's when Satan and his demons has every vestige on this earth against us. The only people that are going to be with you are those that are really your brothers and sisters. But you know your boss at work, the one who you thought understood you? He's going to be against you. And you know your neighbor that lives in your building seems like he's very respectful, he kind of looks out for you? Not anymore. He's going to be against you. And you know your family that you love and uh, you, you don't celebrate the holidays with them, but you kind of spend enough time with them? They're going to be against you. Jesus said, I didn't come to bring peace. You better wake up. I brought a sword. There's going to be a clear distinction between who's on God's side and who's against us. And the only way we're going to survive is if Jehovah has seen that we've closed the gap. 
Jehovah says, if you don't close the gap, I'm not going to close it either. Now, if you don't believe that, you look at the nation of Israel. For years, they assailed the Holy One of Israel. Jehovah told them over and over again, close the gap between what you know and what you do. And they went against his word. And you look closer and you see the mothers who are slicing their children and eating them like bologna. Times are so bad. You know that's going to happen again. And the only way we survive is if we've closed the gap. We're going to see destruction all around and we're going to say, what's in it for me? Jehovah, how can we live? What's the reward for us? Jehovah says, you want something? I'm going to let you live. I'm going to let you live. That's all you get. So may all of us be moved in the days the weeks and the months ahead we've had enough warning that should be sufficient we have clearly the manufacturer's instructions may Jehovah move all of us and give us the spirit and wisdom to close the gap between what we know and what we do